Good afternoon, folks. Welcome to the Vermont House Government Operations Committee. Um, before we get started with today's uh, testimony, I thought it would be worthwhile just to orient us to how how we got here and uh, and what the that we have before us. Um, you know, most of us have been and receiving emails and phone calls from our neighbors, um, our friends uh, who are teachers and who are state employees. And, and, um, and there's a lot of uh, and, um, frustration about the, uh, the proposals that have been put on the table so far. But I think it's really important for us to just recognize for a moment the challenges that bring us to this conversation. Um, you know, our pension system is uh, is not in a good financial setting. Um, our unfunded have been growing, and that has caused a, a an enormous a spike in the ADEC with amount that the general fund needs to um, put in the budget every year uh, in order to um, our our uh, payment plan. The reason. And we have a payment plan uh, dates back to a lot of the historical underfunding that was done um, before many of us were elected here into the and before any of us were sitting in the positions that we're in right now. Um, so stabilizing the public pension system is, uh, is important, uh, even while it is a difficult conversation. And I want to reiter reiterate that at the starting point of that conversation, we are not in the middle. We're not at the end. This is it's not the 11th hour. Um, it feel like it, but we will take as much time as we need to, to hear from folks, to enter into a dialogue and to get this right. Um, uh, so what our hope is here today is to hear the reaction from, uh, from the folks in the system. Um, I understand that uh, a, a poor what you will come to say to us today is we haven't had the time to fully digest what we have before us. Um, when, uh, when the speaker directed us to start having this conversation and to put proposal, um, it was, uh, I think, in, in reaction to the proposal that the treasurer put on the table in January. And I think it's worth just noting some of the key differences between what, what we put on the table earlier this week um, and what proposals have seen earlier. Um, that is a desire to make sure that we're not people who are within five years of retirement. And um, I understand that that there's a lot more refinement needs to be done to define what that means if we're moving forward with that concept, um, because certainly uh, it's not tied what being within five years of retirement means. Um, we have tried to over lay progressivity in uh, in asset to pay more, recognizing that folks on the lower end of the income spectrum need more of their weekly paychecks just to be able to keep a roof over the head and um, and put food on the table. And we've uh, we've proposed a, a measure of uh, risk and reward sharing and um, and that we think is important to uh, to help all of us continue driving towards uh, the health and sustainability of our pension fund. And within that risk and reward sharing, you will notice progressivity uh, again built into that with the recognition that folks who make more um, have a little more uh, flexibility in their weekly paychecks. So um, that's a long, a long preface, but I thought it was important for that uh, to, to be the base level of, of what we're starting with. Um, the speaker has directed us to have this conversation and, and wants us to take as much time as we need. Um, so while we may not get to uh, everything that we need to get to today, um, and it is my desire to give me a, a break away from the computer before we come back to our public hearing at four o'clock this afternoon. Uh, we will be coming back to this again next week in order to engage uh, more deeply with uh, with folks who may not have a chance to 
uh, to, to have full conversation that they want to today. Um, so uh, I think what I'd like to do is, uh, is just run through the folks who are here with us. Um, I'm going to shut my video off because I, my net connection has been unstable regardless of where I go in Bradford today. The internet seems to be sort of iffy, so you get to figure out of the library. Um, and I think I'd like to start with Jeff Fannin. And thank you, Jeff, for being with us. Um, thank you for, for sharing your initial thoughts and perspectives. Oh, thank you. And, and so uh, maybe this is uh, fortuitous. I have a weekly meeting with uh, the Secretary of Education uh, with a bunch of education groups. We've been doing this every Friday since the uh, pandemic started. So I won't be as late. I'll try to stick around and answer any questions, but I may not, after I finish, I may uh, try to get over there to see what's going on in other worlds. So if you don't, if you, if you don't mind. Um, so uh, once again, Jeff Fannin, Executive Director of Vermont NEA. Uh, and I'm here today to speak to the initial pension proposal of the Vice Chair, excuse me, the Chair and the and the Vice Chair that was released on Tuesday. I always like to you know make sure I'm grounded in what we're talking about. In the simplest terms, the proposal requires uh, teachers to pay more, work longer, and get less in retirement. Uh, this proposal is even, is even more severe than the Treasurer's January proposal that she herself described as extreme. In raw terms, the Treasurer's proposal asked teachers to shoulder an additional $250 million in new taxes or fees. And this proposal seems to go further, adding an additional 58 million, uh, thereby asking teachers to shoulder a total of $309 million in new tax burdens. I'll be honest, they are shocked and frankly angry. Uh, at a time when the state is awash in federal money and the governor's budget itself proposes to pay the entirety of the ADAC, uh, my members are asking me, why us, why now? And I think with good reason. Instead of asking what went wrong, uh, the proposal puts the entire burden on teachers, and that is unacceptable. The federal stimulus money is boosting the state's economy dramatically right now. <clears throat> state revenues are up, and we should use those additional new dollars creatively to figure this out without taking money out of teachers' paychecks. Doing now what is proposed is frankly an insult to the hardworking teachers of the state and is unnecessary given the boost from the feds. We agree that the long-term health and viability of the retirement system is a top priority. Indeed, Vermont and EA has negotiated and supported fair and balanced adjustments in both 2010 and 2014. State pension system managers and actuaries told us then that those changes put the system on a long-term path of full funding by 2038. Thoughtfully and expertly examining what happened must be part of any solution going forward. I am concerned that teachers are reacting react rationally to this proposal and may leave the profession at a time when we need them more than ever. As we begin to open up our society, return to some sense of normalcy, including reopening schools fully, we are becoming more and more aware of the pressing needs of our students and driving teachers out because they don't see hope in their retirement is absolutely the wrong message to send these teachers. Uh, many schools in Vermont are already having a hard time attracting fully qualified licensed teachers, and we think this will make the problem even worse. Make no mistake, making these proposed cuts will economically harm teachers now and in the future. And they are beginning to ask us about, about this, how this proposal affects them personally and how they can avoid the proposal, including leaving the profession, in some cases, leaving the state. Uh, if teachers leave, as I'm starting to hear, or even if those who are very close to retirement at the top of the salary schedule have an incentive to stay, that will have an effect on the education fund that so far has not been examined. In other words, the treasurer has cor correctly noted that policy decisions in the education arena do have effects on the retirement system. And conversely, this proposal will do something to the education fund and the teaching workforce in our schools that should be examined so that we don't simply try to solve one problem only to have another problem crop up elsewhere. The proposal only asks teachers and state employees to work longer, pay more, and get less in retirement. If we truly are all in this together, we believe the wealthiest among us who did marvelously in the stock market last year should be asked to pay their fair share. Finally, because I represent teachers, including math teachers, we think we noticed a mathematical error in the proposal. Uh, the pages aren't numbered, but it's the employee risk sharing contribution page 
That tax seems inaccurate to us. 0.5% uh, of $60,000 would be $300, not $200. 0.75% of $80,000 would be $600, not $350. And 1.25% of $100,000 would be $1,250, not $550. Now, instead, if there's a cap on this tax, that's not clear on this page, and, and, and we just wanted that clarified. So maybe the math is, is altered in some way that's not on the page, but that's what we see. Um, the time we have now should be put to good use to answer questions about the actuarial changes the rate of return adjustments and explore equitable solutions. Now is not the time to ask teachers to shoulder even more of the burden when they are already carrying much of the pandemic burden. Frankly, it's unfair. So with that, I'll stop and say thank you and I'm happy to answer any questions. Committee, any questions for Jeff? Mark Higley. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Jeff. Um, in the beginning of your testimony, if you've got it there, you had said that you had looked at this proposal on Tuesday. Uh, it may not be a big deal, but it is to me in a sense that Wednesday is the first that I saw it. I think it was on the uh, on your web. On, I thought I understood it to be on your website on Tuesday. That's when I I got it. I think maybe I'm wrong. On, uh, maybe I'm wrong in the dates. I will be honest with you. In the pandemic world, I'm. I'm um, I'm giving myself grace on days because uh, they all blur together. Uh, so Representative Higley, if I'm off by day, that's on me. I'll, I'll go back and check when I first saw it. I said Tuesday, but it may have been because I was thinking using some of the testimony yesterday or something like that. So maybe I got confused on dates. Fair enough. Well, again, I, I say that it's not that big a deal. But again, I had mentioned on Tuesday, as far as the public hearing went, that we didn't have a new proposal. And there was folks that reached out to me through emails, some of them being teachers, saying that they were surprised that they didn't want to hear from, that I didn't want to hear from them. And I said, you know, that was, there wasn't even a proposal on Tuesday. But anyway, it's just, it does make a difference to me. Thank you. It's an important difference, I, I acknowledge. And, and uh, I will go back, Representative Higley, and double check. I did this this morning after one cup of coffee, and uh, I'll, uh, I'll check my math, as it were, as I, as I, as I asserted in my later in my testimony, checking math is good, showing your work is good, and I'll do so. Thanks, Jeff. No big deal. Peter Anthony. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Jeff, um, it had been suggested when we, as you have just uh, urged, tried to dig into the failure of actuary uh, performance. Uh, predictions, we, uh, at least I heard some testimony which said part of the reason that the actuaries didn't pick up uh, on the growing um, underfunding on the teacher's side was unanticipated early retirements. Digging a little deeper, uh, one answer was some of those were subject to in inducements, <clears throat> if I may, or incentive um, offers at the local level over which we would have no control, no matter what we did. And uh, then later we asked, uh, well, is this ongoing? You've just suggested that it may get worse. I, I guess I wanna know whether at least the uh, locally driven encouragement to get out of senior teachers has that sort of passed through uh, the, the, the likely eligible category or are those inducements still having an effect, which are so difficult to predict, Jeff? Thanks. So I think if I understand the correct the question correctly and the conversation correctly, um, what I'm suggesting is if you, if the proposal as it stands um, may suggest to, to more seasoned teachers, I'll say it that way, <laughs> um, that they should stick around a little bit longer than they might otherwise have wanted to, or they may need to, frankly. So that that's that was that concept. The other concept that I've I've spoken several times with the treasurer about this is um, she has she has asserted, and I think she's done it in this committee that Act Forty Six, the school consolidation school board consolidation law, um, did create some odd. Uh, it did have some consequences for the retirement fund because people stayed 
or left earlier than they might have otherwise done. And they, they may have been fully vested, for example, but because of the change in the consolidation, they, the teacher may have, um, there may not have been the need for two R teachers or something like that. And so people left. And so that was, I think, that's what I've heard from the, the treasurer in that context. The incentives, the retirement incentives that were in some, in some local contracts, I'm not, I think those, and I've said this to the treasurer, I think most of those are gone at this point. And so I, I'm not aware, but I don't keep track of all of them every place. Um, and there are well over 100 contracts. We're unlike the state, you know, we, the, there they just have single contracts for groups of employees. We're all over the state. So those incentives, I think, are, are uh, less of an issue, if that's what you're talking about, the retirement incentives on individual contracts. I think what the treasurer is talking about is Act 46 and its effects. I, I guess I, if I may, Madam Chair, I just want to be sure that we don't have to worry about the continuation of those not wanting to get into the arena of whether or not what the legislature may do somehow trumps local contracts. I don't want to have that legalistic debate, frankly. Uh, so I, I was searching for an answer to, are we done with that incentive effects of Act 46? Because if we're not, the actuary predictions still have the chance, no matter what we do, uh, of being uh, unable to capture that. And I just want to be sure that we are able to capture capture the relevant, uh, uh, how, few, how, how shall I say, retirement predictions. I want accuracy, I think, as everybody else does, so we know what to pay uh, and and what result to expect. Thank you, Jeff. You are, and just just quickly, I respond and say I don't think there's a lot of incentives out there in contracts, and I and given that what I'm hearing is it's not. Uh, there were years ago where the Schools didn't want to carry a lot of teachers and we're trying to figure it out with declining enrollment. We're not hearing that now. In, in fact, the exact opposite. They need teachers. Thank you, Jeff. Yep. John Gannon. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I just wanted to address um, Jeff's concern about our math with respect to risk sharing contributions. Um, our terrific joint fiscal office um, sent me a note. It, it says that the math is correct. It works like an income tax with marginal rates. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate knowing that. You know, math teachers look at math and numbers. And, and uh, so, anyway, I uh, will go back and, and try to understand. Maybe I'll touch base with, uh, with Chris Roop at JFO and, and uh, understand the math on that. So thank you, Representative Gannon. I appreciate you checking. No problem. Uh, yes. Please do um, shoot joint fiscal email. Uh, Tanya Vihoksky, and then I'm gonna disappear for a moment while I try to reboot my computer in hopes that I will be able to be fully participatory here. So go ahead, Tanya, and I'll be back in a moment. Thank you, Madam Chair. Following up a little bit on Representative Anthony's question around the impact of early retirements and retirements, this is a bit of a two-parter. Um, so I'm wondering if we have any numbers or knowledge about how the pandemic has impacted early retirements. In the school that I work in, I know of at least a handful of teachers who have opted to retire rather than continue teaching through the pandemic or are now planning on retiring earlier than anticipated due to the increased stress of the pandemic. And I'm wondering if we have any knowledge of what, if any, impact this is going to have on the pension. And it's a two-parter. Um, but we also know that this plan may cause teachers to choose to retire early. And I'm wondering if we have any numbers on how many teachers would be able to just retire and what, if any, unanticipated consequences that might have on our pension system. So those are great questions, Representative Bahosky. And, and I'm sadly sad to say that I don't know that I'll have all the answers uh, or even much of the answers. I think this is probably a better question for the treasurer's office and frankly, the retirement division. They, they're the ones who, who uh, hear from teachers and state employees when they're applying and, and have the data. So um, I, I think the retirement incentives are, uh, excuse me, the pandemic retirements are real, but it's anecdotal. I, you know, somebody who's eligible to retire and just says, I'm done because of the pandemic, I'm, I'm you know, for any number of reasons, it, it's not, I don't think they have a pandemic box where you have to check and say, <laughs> this is why I'm retiring. So that, that's anecdotal at best, I think. 
but there there are I do know that there have been an uptick to the extent to which I think is uh, probably Erica Wolfing at the retirement office, who probably is the best person to speak with. And the same for um, for the second question as well. So um, I, I'm sorry, I can't answer this. They have the data. I, we, we have membership. It's anecdotal, but um, they don't tell us even when they retire, even they don't have to. Thank you so much. I will make sure to try to follow up with Erica. Great. And Samantha, you have the next question. I do. And I apologize. My signal is not strong, so I need to stay off camera as well. We, uh, the chair and I are very close to each other here in our counties. Um, so I had the same questions and concerns that Mr. Fannin had when I did the math. It did not come out for me. And when you reach out to JFO, if they could please submit how they get their how they've gotten to where they're getting, um, because to me, those were very, very large differences. Um, and if they are going to go off of something that is kind of like the mean or, or even the smaller number they're working with, if they could please at least report that in there, um, because it's not fair to mislead people, especially with something of this magnitude. Yeah, I've got a note to myself. I'll check in with Chris Roop and, and uh, see if I can't figure this out because I, I want to know myself too. Mike McCarthy. Thanks, Madam Chair. Um, I, I wanted to ask Jeff a little bit about the difference between what you described as a tax on teachers and the reduction in unfunded liabilities with some of this proposal. Because um, I think there's a little bit of a conflation there of two things that, that aren't exactly the same. So, you know, if, if over time we reduce unfunded liabilities, with some of the changes in the proposal and the state is also doing, you know, putting in more money, all of us as Vermonters are, I, I wondering if, if we can dig in a little bit on that description of the cost or the estimated cost of this proposal to teachers versus a reduction in the unfunded liabilities of the teacher's pension system. Um, Representative McCarthy, I'm not sure I understand the question. I do understand that, um, you, you know, you're, you're, you may be quarreling, it sounds like, with my use of the word tax. And, and you know, the, the employee risk sharing, as I look at that, is an increase uh, on something somebody's paying. I think of that as a tax. Uh, you could call it a fee. I'm not sure what, uh, you know, a contribution I get is, is what it's, it's labeled as, but in some ways it's a tax. It's coming out of their paycheck. Um, so if that's, and I do acknowledge that the unfunded liability, um, you know, has, has grown. And there's no question about that based on the, the actuarial's reevaluation. Um, um, okay, um, trying to read the, the chat. I'm sorry. Um, so I, I I'm not sure exactly, Representative McCarthy, what. Um, if we're just quarreling about words, that's fine, and I get that, but I'm not sure exactly what you um, want me to be answering. I'm not sure what the question is. I'll just say that. Yeah, I guess I guess my question is just, I, yeah, I mean, I, I guess I, I just wanted to, to go back to what you said about the shared burden of addressing, you know, keeping these funds. Uh, viable into the future like we've tried to ground this work and our consideration of this proposal in preserving the pension funds and i met with some of my local maple run ea members yesterday and they had a lot of questions um but i i'm trying to talk with them clearly about what is being proposed what things are on the table and get their feedback from it i guess to move away from this conversation about exactly what we call the teacher share of what we're proposing um, is just to say that the, the biggest feedback I heard initially from my constituents last night um, was um, around the retirement age. And I heard actually some support for understanding that contribution increases um, you know, might be an equitable way and, and in order from some of 
uh, my local EA members. So I'm wondering if you um, have heard similar feedback in terms of, you know, what things um, NEA members broadly, you know, feel are better, you know, things that they can support on some level that are in these proposals versus things they'd like us to take a deeper dive into. Fair enough. Uh, so whether I receive this on Tuesday or Wednesday, and I'll check my math again there on that, uh, I will uh, say that what we're hearing now, Representative McCarthy, probably, and you you pro you heard it more directly than I did, I guess, last night. So, um, is you know reaction, right? It, it's 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 uh, visceral. It's uh, I'm going to guess angry, frustration, um, and, and you know all of those emotions are in it. Uh, I don't think we've reached a place, having just had this for two or three days, whatever the case may be, to know specifically what uh, seems like they they want to work with. And I, I just don't know. But right now, it, the whole thing it, it hits like a package and is a problem. That's what I'm hearing. So I don't have, you know, it's been two days. And, and the, what, we're getting, what we're getting is probably what you got last night, which is a lot of emotion, anger, frustration. And uh, uh, we're not there yet further on. It's too early. Completely understandable, and um, and uh, you know, I I know the weight of what's been put on the table and how hard it is to unpack that and start to engage. So, um, I very much um, appreciate your challenges in uh, in trying to speak for for a group of people who are overwhelmed and frustrated. Bob Hooper. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Rep. McCarthy brings up to my mind a good question because there are levers that we pull that will impact other things and and it brings a question to mind but if indeed we use the word tax or we use the word fee or whatever if the contribution of the teachers goes up and the state employees then I'll say without something in the plan that correspondingly ensures that the state is going to either match or exceed as they have been generously doing before through the appropriation process, then the, the question to me comes down to something that I think is probably at the, the root of a lot of the teacher's uh, anger. And that is, are, are we trying to solve the problem of the unfunded liability or are we trying to cut the pension benefit? And that might not necessarily be the same thing. I mean, I've mentioned sunsetting this the other day, which would seem to be appropriate if we get to the point where the unfunded liability is extinguished. Um, and that's along with the conversation this morning is probably a good thing, but um, I would expect, and this isn't a question, this is kind of a speech. Um, I would expect that we would expect if the teachers and the state employees are going to be ponying up a considerable amount of extra money that it be at least matched if we're going forward with the process of extinguishing the unfunded liability. Um, I would assume you would agree. I, I would. Thank you for answering that question. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for asking a question, Bob. Do you, any, any more questions? No, thank you, ma'am. Okay, <laughs> Peter Anthony. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Chair. Uh, let, let me go at this uh, somewhat similarly to my friend, uh, Rep Hooper. I had a, <clears throat> a colleague <clears throat> in the legislature who said, in summary fashion, um, the contribution, the employees own. The unfunded liability, the legislature owns. Simple. You know, I don't know how else to, to put it. Having said that, because we have a latitude of funds that we didn't know we had, uh, I think what we need to do is figure out what, and I appreciate the fact that you've only had a couple of three days, four days, two days to hear from the members. I, I, I really need to know where we have wiggle room. I don't expect you to answer that today. But where is it on either side, the um, contribution side or the benefit side, that we could agree on a figure 
to inject, for instance, on our uh, responsibility side of the fence uh, so that we can buy ourselves some time to talk about the more uh, policy, surgical, uh, granular, as some people like to call it, issues uh, for which there's no clear path forward uh, immediately, obviously, on the table. Um, and, and I, for somebody who wants to, to go forward in one fashion or another, but not lose the opportunity to harness some of the uh, infusion of cash, I want to know where the things we could agree on harness those funds and which short list of, of issues could we just say, all right, look, let's agree to think about those a little more deeply, but we can't hold up the whole show till we settle everything. It's, it's just, that's not realistic, uh, given where the treasurer is, given essentially where the session is. Um, so I, 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 I'm just trying to tease out where can we agree enough to commit sufficient funds so that teachers quit panicking and uh, pro uh, postpone for a longer uh, and more searching conversation issues that, albeit sensitive, at least could be discussed in a less panic-ridden environment. Thanks. Uh, I'm not sure if there's a question there, but I, I thank you. The, the, the notion, Representative Anthony, is, is a good one. And just for the record, uh, I just saw it pop in my email something from JFO, Chris Roop, uh, and uh, I'll, I'll check that afterwards. And maybe the math is in there. Uh, Bob Hooper, your hand is still up or again up. Again up, Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, you know, we've focused a little bit, Jeff, and I, I'm hearing from a couple of teachers. Um, I don't know if you have a switch on that or not. Um, but, uh, you know, there's a distinct line being drawn in the proposal between the five-year and under people and the five-year and over people in terms of their closeness to walking out the door uh, in a regular process, not, not buying time process. And, and it seems like a lot of the, the people who are over five years, both in the teacher's population and in the state employee's population are more aggravated because uh, they haven't been given the, the magic key to get out unharmed and the, the level of faith that they've lost in the system seems to be driving something a little bit more intense than uh, I expected. Because um, those, you know, you do have five years to make different plans, but that's, that's not enough. I mean, quite frankly, in this environment, probably nothing is. Are you, are you seeing that more so than we are seeing in the emails? I mean, is there now a fundamental disruption in the trust of us? that you're getting feedback on? Um, <clears throat> I think there is a fundamental concern out in the field with how all of this is going to affect individuals. So if you're a teacher who uh, is 20 years in the system and suddenly you've got to work another 20, what was it, five, I think it is under the, under the proposal, that that affects your life and depend, you know, whether you've got kids in college or kids in elementary school, those are the things. So it's, it's a, it's a sense of un the unknown and is the concern with a lack of trust. I think there is an element very much of that. Yes. That I, you know, somebody else out there is doing something that is really affecting um, my livelihood, my future, my family, um, and, and all of that. And, and it's been a tumultuous year, as we all acknowledge. And then this is sort of um, a, another significant blow at, at a particularly, you know, inopportune moment, I'll say that. And, and so the, the other piece of this is teacher contracts by law are going out April 15. So teachers have to have a contract offer from, for next year. So people are starting to think about that right now. And with this proposal layered on top, I don't know, you know, we're hearing a lot. It's just a lot of frustration, noise, emotion. And I'm, I'm genuinely concerned that come April 15, I'm going to hear a lot more concrete. What if I do X? What if I do Y? And I, I don't know that I will have answers for all, all of those X and Ys. 
and I'm not sure the retirement office will either. I have, I mean, quite frankly, having talked to the retirement office, had them in here and had people email me that, you know, I used to get somebody at least answering the phone. Now I'm being told nobody's answering the phone. They're just doing email. Uh, and the line continues to get longer and longer for somebody to get an estimate. Uh, I don't think they know, quite frankly. And, and that's really, you know, that's really bothersome that we can't get the information we need either on the cost of the plans that I personally asked for three times, I think, or uh, how long the lines are, how many people we're gonna lose, where we're gonna lose them, uh, whether the teacher that's in Bennington now has made a decision staying in Vermont or jumping over to New York State to work is now advantageous. Um, the unintended consequences of this are legion and I'm worried that we stumble. Thank you. Me too. I share the worry. Okay. Um, any other committee questions for Jeff? All right. Thank you, Jeff. Please stick around if you can, but I understand you're trying to be in two places at once. Double Thank zoom. you all. I'll stick, for, stick around for a bit. Great. Thank you. Uh, Steve Howard. Welcome. Thank you for being here with us today. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and I again, we'll apologize. The small project I had going on yesterday is now turned into a major construction scene. And uh, you may hear a jackhammer from time to time. Uh, I'm afraid to go downstairs and see what they're doing, but some at some point I will find out. But if you hear a jackhammer, that's what it is. Um, so thank you very much for the opportunity to testify. My name is Steve Howard. I'm the executive director of the Vermont State Employees Association. And before I start my testimony, I wanted to thank the committee uh, for your uh, dedication and willingness to have a public hearing tonight and Monday. The SEA uh, called for the public hearing. We're very grateful for your response. And I know uh, those are, you know, it's, it's hard with uh, that many people uh, on a Friday night. So I really wanted to express your uh, my, our gratitude for that. It's, it's an important thing for our members. Uh, they want to know that the committee that is uh, potentially going to cut their pension uh, can look them in the eye and see who they are and hear their stories uh, and see the human faces and the experiences behind all the spreadsheets and the actuarial numbers and the JFO reports, <laughs> which we all are, are all necessary part of the process. But ultimately, all of that is about the people that you will see tonight on their Zoom screens. Um, let me start by saying um, that the VSEA is opposed to this proposal, um, and we, um, we very much appreciate the chair's comments yesterday um, about the hard work and the personal sacrifice of our members that, that have been, and the teachers who, that have been made throughout um, the COVID uh, crisis to protect the lives of Vermonters and to protect Vermont um, most, more effectively than, than most states in the country. Uh, nurses who fought to protect patients at the vet's home in the psychiatric hospital, correctional officers who battled outbreaks in our prisons, uh, wearing modified garbage bags, um, health department workers who are, who are currently, as we speak, testing, contract, taste, contra contact tracing, and vaccinating Vermonters, our economic service and Department of Labor employees who worked around the clock to protect Vermonters who had just lost their jobs, um, AOT tr truck drivers who drove materials and supplies all over the state, um, all the employees who showed up, who converted their homes in, in, into state offices in order to keep state government running. You've heard me say this before, and I, I, I think it bears repeating. They don't have press conferences every week, uh, but they deserve the credit for how Vermont uh, has come out of this pandemic. It's fair to say that these members, while they appreciate your, ki your kind words, feel abandoned, they feel attacked. Some feel betrayed by the, by the proposal that uh, was introduced two days ago. Uh, this, this proposal has profound impacts on their lives, their hopes, their dreams. They feel a promise was made, a contract signed. And now, uh, after their heroic efforts, uh, it's answering the call once again for Vermonters, they feel like they're in the middle of a smackdown, basically. Um, they thought that even especially in the midst of a pandemic, that the political leadership of our state 
would have their backs. Uh, they don't feel that way when they review this proposal. Our members understand um, that politics and political tactics will be used even here in Vermont, where we're somewhat immune to what happens across the country in other state houses and in, in Congress. But this process leaves them dumbfounded. Uh, last night, a member even described it to me as shady. Um, they, the way they see it, a bill was developed by a committee um, behind closed doors, which has been acknowledged by the leadership, both privately to us and publicly in the media. Um, that was outside the transparent process that this committee, uh, this distinguished committee affords. Um, it's not something that we see that often in Vermont. Um, and it's, I think from our members perspective, very uh, disturbing. When we're asked why we can't take our time on a complicated, consequential and long developing problem with a careful and deliberate summer study process, we are told that it's because of the political calendar, that we have to rush this through this year, regardless if the process leaves thousands of state employees believing that the process is rushed and rigged. They don't believe that the political calendar is their problem, and they uh, have confidence that this committee and the members of the General Assembly uh, can handle uh, both, um, both uh, the political challenges that they face and this issue next year after a a process um, goes forward that they can believe in. And so they've asked me to come here today to ask you once again to slow this down. Um, that they really wanted me to appeal to six people on this committee uh, who can still save this process. Uh, create a summer study committee that is equally divided between teachers, employees, troopers, and the members of the General Assembly. We have always done our part and we've always worked together. We are telling you really that our members are exhausted. Uh, this has almost been a year now of unbelievable sacrifice. And they're asking, can't they just give us that? Can't they just give us a summer study committee? Um, they're also concerned about the proposal that they see um, before the committee um, because they know we, we will work with you and we we will work with you, especially if we feel we'll, we have been treated respectfully. And if all ideas are on the table, including a dedicated revenue source, uh, noticeably missing from this proposal and yet identified with the leadership in, in our 30 minute check-ins with the speaker as one of the state employees top priorities. You've heard me say this before and I just have to say this again, in 30 years, we can't muster the courage to ask the wealthiest people to pay one cent more. We need leaders in both the legislature and in the executive who are willing to lead, to lead like Governor Snelling, and to be willing to do at least something they, might, they may not want to do. And that is how deals get done. That is how progress gets made. Letting the governor off the hook and refusing to raise revenues to help the situation because we're afraid to engage the governor and we've decided he gets a pass on leadership is not acceptable to state employees. Governor Scott, who has a skyrocketing approval rating uh, at this moment in a crisis in our state uh, could stick his neck out and lead uh, like Governor Snelling. And that we think is uh, something that is not too much to ask. Instead, we see a proposal that taxes state employees that tells AOP, AOT drivers plowing your roads state police lieutenants who are responding to domestic assaults, the dietary aid making $12 an hour at the Vermont Veterans Home, that they can be on the menu. But the governor and the wealthiest amongst us are protected. That is not leadership. Inflicting pain on those with almost no power and no responsibility for this situation is the easy way out. Pensions benefit all Vermonters. 62 cents on every dollar from in our, in our pension system is a result of our proceeds from investment on Wall Street. 78% of our members retire and stay in your local communities here right in this state. They are pulling money out of Wall Street and spending it on Main Street. And they did so, um, they do so after having worked a, a career in which they um, might not have come to state government and, current, and, and they stayed longer than they might uh, otherwise have because of the pension. Your constituents benefit from that 
from the institutional knowledge, from the experience that they have um, serving uh, the people of the state of Vermont. And we've seen it in times like this and in times like Irene and whenever they've been called out, that institutional knowledge and experience has come through for Vermonters. As Jeff said, we agree that this plan is a plan that asks our members to work longer, to pay more, to get less. Our members see this as a radical plan that is really a national outlier. Um, just to go through some of the elements of the plan and the response that they have, uh, the COLA threshold in the floor threatens to destroy the retirement dignity our members have worked so hard for. It's potentially, um, it could potentially put some of them into poverty, dependent on state services, some of the services they may have delivered, state employees. Um, and most of, most of the retirees, again, I, I think it bears repeating, are women. Um, we also would know that Vermont's pension system nationally is already 7% less than the national average in terms of pension benefits. So already we are, uh, we are behind other states across the country and this, this proposal would only move us further behind. The change to the AFC, which is really a direct cut in benefits, only two other states have an AFC higher than five years, Florida and Illinois. The 10 year vesting pr proposal doesn't make any sense to us at all. Um, we think it will affect um, the young workers that we have worked so hard to attract to state government uh, who look and say, you know, I can, I can, I have an opportunity to get out and go into the private sector and I'm going to do it now. Uh, we think it will be very difficult to, to attract new younger employees to come or new employees to come to state government uh, because of the longer wait. And really it doesn't, do much for the unfunded liability or for the um, for the employer contribution. So that that proposal in particular baffles our members. Um, I would say in, in relation to risk sharing and the contribution rate, state employees have always done their share. Every single time they have been asked to come to the table to do something to stabilize the retirement system. They've always done their share. The process has been collaborative, it's been respectful, and it's been um, frankly, given the amount of time it needs for, a, for an agreement to come to fruition. Um, so that is, um, that is, I think, an important part. We do wonder and question why the, um, why the trigger is at 7.5% and not at 7%, which is the actuarial assumed um, uh, investment return. Retirement eligibility. Only four states have a retirement age between 65 and 67 for state employees. Illinois, Massachusetts, Missouri, and South Dakota. If you're a teacher in New Mexico, you would also have that age. This would put us in a very small group of states as a radical proposal and an out, really an outlier nationally. That is not, um, a, dis that is not a um, distinction or a characterization or a, 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 I'm thinking of searching for the right word of anything that our members want Vermont to be known for. They want Vermont to be known as the best employer in the country. Uh, this would put us on a list of some of the worst. Um, they also think it's just an, an, an horrendously unfair. Um, this is not the deal that our members signed up for when they began their state service. I talked to a member recently, and actually sorry, the days do become a blur and the nights become part of the day. So it's really hard to keep up with this, but I remember this story because this was a story of a, a single mother who has four children, who's worked 21 years, dedicated, and going to college all that time, trying to raise her four children so that she eventually could do the job that she had dreamed of doing. Under this proposal, she will have to work another 24 years to get the retirement she thought she was working towards. That is just crushing uh, for her and for so many of the employees who, who are in the same situation. Also, this is this age of retirement. I think uh, Jeff made reference to it, and I think um, Representative McCarthy um, may have heard from his from his, some of his constituents yesterday about it. But I just want you to think about this. Our correctional officers uh, have, um, and many state employees have jobs that 
nobody else wants to do and many could not do. But think about this, the average, um, the average um, age of uh, uh, life expectancy for a correctional officer is 59 years old. The national average for the rest of us is 75. They have higher rates of hypertension, heart disease, and alcoholism, high suicide rates, and they suffer from PTSD and trauma. They're, they have a 50% divorce rate. In their job, they are required to use use of force and to be trained on use of force. They are often attacked physically. They're, they have often uh, forced to do extractions from cells and they have frequently faced hostage situations in our facilities here in Vermont. The correctional facilities, and I don't know if any of you have been to the correctional facilities in Vermont, uh, but they're big, they're old, they're, uh, they're spread out. And our correctional officers often, they have, they're required to do 15 minute checks that require them to run from one end of the building to another up several flights of stairs. This proposal asks them to do that until they're 67 years old. The same is true of our state police lieutenants. Uh, this, this proposal removes the ability to retire after 20 years at age 50. I got an email just this morning from a trooper uh, who said that he um, was planning to retire because he had frankly done the last, his last use of force uh, in physical ground battle um, that he thought he could handle both emotionally and physically. Talked about a scene in which he this week was out uh, and wrestling a man of 20 years, 20, who was 20 years old, who had just brutally attacked his wife. He does not think he can do that for one more year. And yet this proposal asks him to do it for five. I don't think this committee is um, knows, I think this committee very well uh, knows the history of our, of our family service workers in the Department of Children and Families. They are regularly attacked, regularly threatened, assaulted, and murdered. And they are asked to do a job that is traumatic and difficult. Our workers at the Vermont Veterans Home in the State Hospital, they are working with patients who have both physical and mental health issues. And they are not only required to do several tasks that require heavy lifting, but also they are unfortunately um, the recipients of brutal violent attacks. Many of our members are rushed from their work site to the hospital because of the attacks that they endure. This proposal would have them do that until they're 67 years old. So not all jobs are the same. Many of the jobs that our members do in the public sector demand uh, both physical, uh, physical and mental toll that makes this proposal um, really um, untenable for them and for, for many others. Um, we look forward to, to talking with you about incentives and ways in which we could keep uh, valuable and state employees who have reached the maximum contribution uh, uh, level uh, to the pension system and are essentially donors to the pension system. Uh, we, we, we look forward to talking with you about those benefits that keep them here longer. Uh, we need more experienced and seasoned workers. Uh, just similar to the conversation that you were having with Jeff, uh, the anecdotal message that we're getting of an overwhelming response from our members is that our seasoned and most talented and experienced workers are running for the retirement division's door. They are filling out their retirement and they're getting ready to leave. And that's at a time when if you just look at some of our most valuable, um, some of the most critical cl uh, classifications in state government, you know, we have 30 vacant tr trooper positions, 80 to 100 vacant correctional officers, 46 vacant positions for CDL drivers in the, in the agency of transportation. We spend millions of dollars on traveling nurses uh, for the state of Vermont. So with the, with the benefit package that we have now that is lower than the national average, we have a hard time attracting people and keeping them in these, uh, in these positions. Um, so I just wanna conclude again by thanking you for the opportunity I want to encourage you tonight and Monday to look into the eyes of the people who are testifying, to listen to their stories and ask yourself, is it really so much to ask that we slow this process down and we have a summer study committee? 
Is it really too difficult for us to say that the wealthiest people in this state can't pay 3% more rather than taxing the people who are testifying before you? And I would finally say, work with us for a better solution. Work together with us to find a better solution in an open and transparent process that our members can believe in. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. John Gannon. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and, and thank you, Steve, so much for testifying and for giving us um, some of the concerns um, of your members. Um, and I look forward to the public hearings tonight um, and on Monday. And as you know, I, I also attended the local Wyndham County um, DSEA meeting and, and spoke directly um, with members from Wyndham County. Um, it, it's important to have a dialogue. And I totally agree that we need to have a dialogue with respect to all these issues. But we're running out of time. It is 2021. If we want to fully fund the pension by our goal of 2038, that's 17 years away. Every year that we delay increases the unfunded liability. And that, that has been a problem because it, it increases because of the costs, but also because of the missed assumptions, um, which people, you know, I'm not gonna point fingers at whose fault that is, but that, that is an issue. We're just running out of time. We also have a once in a lifetime opportunity this year because of the federal funding that's available to help address this problem. And I don't wanna lose, lose that opportunity. And you know, as far as you know, the, the chair and I working on this project um, before it came to the committee, this is a very complicated issue. Um, you know, understanding all the nuances um, of the pensions, working with the Joint Fiscal Office, working with actuaries, so we could have numbers um, with respect to some of the proposals we put forward takes time, and it's hard to do. So yes, I'll fully acknowledge we did that, but the process of deliberating what we're going to do starts in this committee. We have taken extensive testimony already to give members of this committee the background they need to make the important decisions with respect to our, our state employees pension and our teachers pension. And we will take much more testimony. And we wanna work with you to do this. As I said on the floor this morning, when the, the amendment to increase, you know, you know, the taxes on people earning over 500,000, I said, sponsors, bring it here. Bring it to our committee so we can discuss it and actually take testimony on it. We were open to any solutions to this problem, but ignoring the fact that we were running out of time, I think it's a huge mistake. Thank you. Thank you, Representative. I don't know if you had a, if you were asking a question, but what I would say is we, we agree with a lot of what you said. Um, we, we do have to get our arms around this problem. We acknowledge that. Um, what I would say is I don't think um, really it's the state employees who are could be um, held accountable for with the situation that we're in. Um, but I think it's right to not really look back at that. The one thing I would say, and I maybe was a little harsh with uh, Governor Scott, and I, would, I will own that, uh, but I will say that he has fully funded the ADEC. He has given us the ability to take our time and to have a balanced discussion uh, with this summer study committee that's 50% of the workers who are impacted and 50% of the legislators who will make the policy decisions. Uh, that, that provides us the time that we need uh, without really serious implications to the, to the pension system. Certainly no group in the state uh, would want uh, anything um, um, uh, horrific to happen to the pension system and the people who are dependent on it. And you're gonna see that tonight when you, when you hear their testimony. So I really appreciate what you had to say. And I am grateful for your coming to our meetings. And um, I look forward to um, the, the both public hearings tonight and, to, and Monday. Thank you. And just to, to one more point is, you know, we, the, the legislature has been doing more than what the governor has been doing. We have, you know, put in more money than we were required to based on the ADAC. And we've done that consistently for 10 years. And what has happened over those 10 years? Our unfunded liabilities have continued to grow. That's not because of the legislature's um, failure to fund the ADAC. It is because some of the issues with some of the assumptions and we need to fix these problems now. We are just running out of time. Tanya Vyhovsky. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. I have two questions. One is actually more about committee process and one is for Mr. Howard, but in response to your request that we look at additional revenue streams, including something like the amendment that was brought forward on the floor today, I'm curious, what is the process for the sponsor of that amendment to bring, to bring it to this committee so that we can fully vet it and discuss it? Because I agree, we should really look at every possibility of asking those who have more than they could ever need to help support those who are holding our state up during this crisis. And so I'm, I, I don't, I just don't know what the process is. How do we bring that amendment here so that we can fully discuss it and, and vet it and talk about it? So um, in the broadest brush, this committee doesn't do um, revenue. Um, and in order to consider revenue, it, the details of that would be considered in the Ways and Means Committee. In order for us to consider uh, the suggestion of revenue, that would be a conversation that goes above the pay grade of a committee chair um, and needs to involve uh, the, the direction of House leadership. And they need to converse with Senate leadership because uh, we don't take revenue lightly when we uh, begin to talk about uh, adding a tax here or a fee there. Um, that's something that is best done if we have baked that um, ahead of time with the Senate. So um, I don't know what to tell you about the timing of that. Um, I can tell you that the speaker has uh, put on the table $150 million in one-time money that she would like us to use to help solve this problem. That's over and above the funding of the ADEC. And I think it's a, a significant contribution to the problem given, um, given the way we are looking at ballooning unfunded liabilities. Uh, so I guess I would ask us to stay within the constraints of the $150 million that the speaker has, uh, has carefully <laughs> pulled together and, uh, and asked the Appropriations Committee to dedicate to this. Okay, so the process, even though it was the, what was pointed to on the floor was the process of bringing it to this committee, that isn't actually the process. Um, it certainly can come to this committee. It will then also have to go to the uh, Ways and Means Committee. Okay, thank you for helping me to understand that. My question for Steve is about the Department of Labor vacancies. We've heard a lot through the pandemic about the impacts of the Department of Labor and my understanding is they regularly operate with 30 plus vacancies. Do you have the number of vacancies and the number of people that could retire from the Department of Labor tomorrow handy? I don't have it um, off the top of my head. I can look into it. Um, I have been trying to get the numbers uh, from the retirement division on um, various classifications of um, and who's eligible. Um, I have not been, I don't think they've been hiding it, but I just, I just don't think I've been successful in asking for it in the right way. But I do think that's, you know, the Government Operations Committee does have to be concerned about staffing state agencies. Um, and, you know, we saw that what happens when you have a, a, a major incident and, and your constituents call the Department of Labor and the, the folks there are completely overwhelmed uh, by what they have been provided for resources um, in order to serve your constituents. Uh, so I think getting that information, it's a very good question, Representative, uh, either uh, from JFO or from the Retirement Division or waiting until we can get it from somebody who can put it together. Uh, for the government operations committee, it's really important to know, you know, how will this affect people if if there is a, this massive uh, rush to retirement that we are hearing about anecdotally. I mean, I have heard from divisions where, you know, um, you know, twenty six percent. I heard the other day, twenty six percent of the of the staff at the veterans home is eligible for retirement, and there was a division uh, that. Uh, where a member uh, called me, I don't know if it was in the Department of Labor, but they said, you know, four out of five people who do that work in the Agency of Natural Resources are eligible for retirement. Um, this could be a catastrophic event in and of itself for state government if we haven't carefully planned it, which is why I think we've, we're asking to slow this process down and to take some time uh, and have a, a balanced, I think, um, Representative Colston asked yesterday, uh, yesterday, and I wasn't prepared to answer it, but you know, the question about equity and equality, 
having a discussion over the summer and fall with a committee of 50% workers and 50% legislators um, is a pretty equal um, opportunity to, to really try to hash these things out in a more thoughtful, thoughtful and deliberate uh, manner than we, we are here doing now. Thank you both for helping me understand all of the intricacies of that. Mark Higley. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, thank you, Steve, Jeff. Uh, I guess first I'd just like to say that uh, I actually am leaning towards uh, giving more time to this process. Uh, as each day goes on with more testimony and things come out, uh, you know, Jeff talked about uh, April 15th, uh, the teacher's contracts are due. Uh, Bob talked about uh, pension information to employees is hard to get right now. I know that for a fact. Uh, like I said, told people in the past, my wife is just retired. She's, she's still working uh, contractually right now, but retired from uh, uh, the state college system. Um, two years prior, uh, we talked with TIAA folks over in Williston, um, but during her month of retirement, she was not able to get through. They've moved people out of the Williston office. Uh, unless you have a million dollar portfolio, they don't want to talk to you. Um, and so she had to call the main branch, which is, you know, somebody we've never talked to before. So I completely understand that issue as well. Um, I think uh, um, I think everything hasn't been looked at. Um, I think, you know, uh, Madam Chair, you spoke the other day about turning over every rock. Uh, I have mentioned as well as uh, a number of times about meeting with folks uh, from the Reason Foundation, whoever it might be, that there are other states out there that are having a hybrid system that is working. I'd like to at least understand that. Maybe run it by Steve and Jeff as to their thoughts about new employees coming on. Uh, the state of Michigan, I think I mentioned this to Jeff before, in their teacher's retirement has moved or is moving uh, to a DC plan. It seems like it's going well. Um, I guess to go further to talk about uh, one of the things that I wouldn't support, and I spoke to it on the floor, was the taxation of the wealthy in Vermont. Um, you know, it seems like every issue, and, and it was an issue during the gubernatorial campaign last year, uh, that broadband investment and economic recovery for COVID was, was going to be looked at through a tax on the wealthy. Of course, now we're flush with money uh, from the feds. Climate action, That's there's bills out there now. Um, education funding was talked about. Now pensions. I mean, I, I think Steve, you even talked about, you know, the temporary employees receiving more benefits, healthcare and so forth. Um, you know, this is where myself as a conservative, not that we don't want the same end results a lot of times with these things, but let me give you another example. So, so there's a proposal out there again, and I fought this years ago, parts of it, uh, for uh, free lunches for all school kids. Well, you know, that's fine, but how does that relate to if you're talking about the people who make over 250,000, 500,000 or millionaires, why shouldn't they pay for their kids' meals for goodness sakes? You know, I mean, it, we, we've got to understand what we do on one end uh, affects all the taxpayers in Vermont. Um, so again, uh, I, I'm not inclined to reach out for that form of a revenue, uh, a, a certain revenue uh, stream. Um, I don't think we've looked at all the opportunities, um, not in my mind. And uh, yeah, so, and, and politically, I don't know, I'm not in leadership. I don't know if it's because we have the redistricting next year. I'm not sure if it's because it's a political election year. That's that's above my pay grade. Um, but to be honest with you, I, I guess one of the things, if we do move forward, I would like to at least know uh, how much we might be looking at that we would, as the state, would need to cough up again uh, in, in the next year to, to keep things going. Um, but other than that, I, I'm leaning towards um, from what I've seen as well, and Steve, you know, I was at the uh, Lamoille County uh, VSEA meeting the other day, the only representative there. And um, 
they they had only heard about it uh you know i mean again that was wednesday and that's when we first had it come out and i said i just barely got off you know committee talking about this president really had her handle on you know what was happening as much as i did for sure uh so anyway uh that's where i stand right now and uh Again, appreciate the discussion. Thank you. Bob Hooper. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> um, I, I, don't, I don't know that I have said this. And if I have said it, I haven't said it enough. I, I actually do appreciate what you and John have done with this, even though uh, you know, I'm clearly on the page that says it's ghastly you did put a lot of time and effort into putting the gears at least on the table and trying to make a mash. And you know, that, that's something that I think we should recognize. And I apologize for not doing that before. Um, but now after, after Tanya's question, I, I don't know what we're doing. I mean, on the floor now, we just had an amendment that, um, did go around process, no question. And quite frankly, I didn't know it was coming until this morning. But a lot of the conversation was, bring those things here and we'll integrate them into our process and we'll make a decision about how they fit. Now, that's not the way it's kind of gonna be maybe. Uh, you know, We can't get the information that we need to make a decision about the unintended consequences of what we're doing. We're, you know, just so many of the pieces of the puzzle don't seem to be at our disposal. Um, I, I think we need to get some firm ground on what our actual charge and, and abilities are here. Um, you know, there's still probably conversations going on other places that aren't even at this theoretical table. Uh, it's, I, I go back to the question I had this morning. It's like, are we here to solve a problem or are we just here to cut the retirement plan? Uh, I, don't, I don't really know. But I do know I'd like to be able to say, here's a solution that might help solve the problem. We should be able to entertain it without throwing it through another screen first. And if the speaker has the latitude of giving us, us that, that would be a good thing. Thank you. So we, we do have a couple more folks that we need to hear from in order to be respectful here. So I'm, I guess that what I'd like to do is ask the committee to contain questions to, uh, at this point, to what Steve Howard has said, and we will have plenty of time to um, lay claim to our own turf and express our own ideas and opinions. Um, but right now, we have a waiting room full of people who we're hoping to start at two, and I still would like to hear from the other impacted parties. So uh, Sam Lefebvre, and then we will move on. Thank you, Madam Chair. My question is for Mr. Howard. In his testimony, I heard that you said that there are still six people on this committee. Um, could you verify, because last thing I knew, there was 11 of us here, and I would like to know who the six you have your faith in are. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> that is a very good question. I'll take six votes from anybody who's willing to provide them. <laughs> Sam, if I could help, it's, it's to move the process along. In other words, slow it down. He's looking for six, six to five. Six to five to slow the process down, have a summer study and move the process along in that regard. That's the, that's the six he's looking for. Doesn't matter who. <clears throat> Simple committee math. Okay, um, thank you. Any other folks wanna ask a question of Steve Howard? All right, thank you, Steve. Please stick around in case other folks think of questions. Um, Mike O'Neill, thank you so much for coming back to chat with us again today. Um, would love to hear your thoughts. Good afternoon, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, my name is Mike O'Neill. I'm the executive director of the VTA. The VTA leadership had the opportunity to meet with our members yesterday and get reactions to these proposals. As we expected, the proposals have created shock, anxiety, anger, concern um, within our ranks. The proposals put forth by the committee asked that state employees and teachers work longer, receive reduced benefits, and pay more for the benefits. Um, that wasn't received well by our members. 
The message from our, our members was clear. They are opposed to these proposals. They see this as a betrayal. When coming into state service, employees begin making mandatory contributions into the retirement system. For Group C members, the contribution rate is 8.53% of their earnings. This is not insignificant um, you know, with the amount of money they are contributing from their earnings. They make these contributions with the understanding that the state of Vermont will honor their commitment to provide the benefits that have been promised. The relationship between our employees and the state of Vermont concerning retirement is a contract. This has been established by courts throughout the United States. Our members are asking that this contract be honored. The proposal put forth did not include input from employee representative. We did not even learn about the proposals until they were released on Wednesday. Um, and I definitely learned of these on Tuesday, I, I, I'm on Wednesday. I'm guessing Jeff did as well. Um, these benefit changes have unintended consequences on our workforce. I don't know that these consequences have even been explored. For VSP, this is going to result in making a bad situation worse. The Vermont State Police are in the midst of trying to address a recruitment crisis being faced by law enforcement nationwide. The number of police applicants has plummeted across the country. It should be noted that we only um, hire three to 4% of the applicants that we receive. Uh, young qualified people are no longer coming into the profession but there are a small number that are qualified of the applicants we see. Out of every 100 applications, we may hire three or four of those people. Making that challenge bigger for us and diminishing benefits that help us recruit and attract people is going to be a disaster for us. This is occurring at a time when we need to attract the best and most qualified people to meet the expectations of our society, something that your committee knows well you have taken up in your committee issues of police reform and are joining in the rest of this nation and expecting very high standards from our people. We are also going to face a problem with retaining the people that we have if these proposals are passed. We heard from our junior members that they will look for other opportunities um, for employment. We know that with the recruitment crisis going on nationwide, the surrounding states are also hiring. State police agencies are hiring at the same rates we are. They are seeing the same recruitment problems. And if a qualified trooper from Vermont applies to a neighboring state, it is gonna be very easy for them to go and you know, accept jobs in those other states. The benefits in the surrounding states already outpace the benefits of the Vermont State Police. So it's going to give more of an incentive for the people that we have to look at other opportunities. Our senior members are in a more difficult position. They have committed to this career in serving the state of Vermont and they have roots in Vermont. It's not as easy for them to leave. Now their family's retirement plans are in danger of being dramatically altered. How do they recover from changing retirement benefits and plans that they've made with this short notice? Yeah, yes, exempting people within five years may give some comfort to a small group of people, but it was mentioned earlier, that's gonna cause a divide amongst not only our members, but in the trust they do have for this system. Testimony should be taken from Colonel Birmingham to understand the negative impacts these changes will have on the state police. A real problem will be created, it cannot be ignored, this statement is not intended to ignore the same issue, the rest of state government and the, uh, we're gonna see with Vermont teachers. You know, they, they face the same problems. Teachers work on the borders as well. It'd be even easier for a teacher to cross over and work in a border state than it would be for a trooper because we are required to live in Vermont. You know, for, for our members, they would have to move to another state. Most state police agencies require that. Our teachers don't. It would be easy for teachers and other state employees to just cross the border to other jobs. We need to understand the impact that this may have on our workforce. The benefit package that we have, whether it's pay, health insurance, or retirement, is all part of a package that is important in recruiting and retaining the people that work for us. And we cannot ignore that. We understand the issues that have brought us here. The unfunded liability in the Visters plan and the Visters plan is concerning to our members, as concerning to our members as it is to every member of this committee. 
our members and their families rely on these retirement benefits. They get this. We, we are not suggesting that this be ignored. We agree that gr the retirement plans must be sustainable. We do not agree with the proposal, these proposals as the answer. We feel this was done far too, qu too quickly with no input. Our members were not even given a voice in these proposals. We ask how more federal dollars may be, the federal dollars that have come in Vermont, into Vermont may be used to lower the unfunded liability to address this year's ADEC. We ask that a retirement commission be established to carefully study the system as a whole and make sure we identify all of the problems, clearly understand how we got here. You know, were mistakes made? Was there bad advice? What, what was the problem that resulted in all of the missed actuarial assumptions in the investment return targets that were not met. Quickly making changes to the governance system and the structure of employee benefits is not what we feel is the right way to approach this. How do we have confidence in reactionary changes being made without fully understanding all of the aspects of the problem? Thank you. I would be happy to answer any questions from the committee. Thanks, Mike. <clears throat> Fascinating. Nobody has a question for you. Uh, just can't get a hand raised. There we go. Go ahead, Bob. Uh, Mike, we talk a lot about vacancies and where'd you go? Oh, there you are. Uh, do you have a, a good handle on how many people come in the door, get through the academy, maybe get one stripe and then they're on their way that, that Vermont is effectively being used as a a training site so that you you go to mass you go back to massachusetts since i hear that accent a lot and uh you know you're you're basically a trained with with time on the road trooper and you're right in the door is that really prevalent or are we actually seeing people with five years six years somewhere in that range jumping as it exists now without these changes? We generally see, and it's been the same through my, throughout my entire career, about an average of 10 people that we will get trained, get out on the road, that will leave each year to go to other agencies, whether it's another state or a federal agency. G generally, we see people leave to go to other state police agencies or the feds because the benefit package is better, but it has remained consistent but we are hearing right now from a lot of members that if these proposals were passed, they are really going to look at other opportunities because the benefits they were promised will not be there. Yeah, you know, this is going to add to a problem that we are already facing. We currently have 32 vacancies in a department that is authorized strength of 332 people. Those vacancies are on top of 14 military deployments that we currently have. So staffing right now is a real challenge for us. And if this makes it worse, I don't know how we get through it. Well, another question, if I might, Madam Chair, in, in the, the group F, the, the regular workforce of the state, we've focused in on the people that have 25 years who can then buy the last five and walk out the door in an unanticipated way. I would think that it would be different with the state police because anybody that's facing the mandatory 55 age retirement, either in federal or other law enforcement agencies is gonna to wanna to be out our door and into another agency so that they can have time to vest and get a benefit before they run up against that 55. So we're talking about as a potential field of people who would be considering leaving a huge number within the, the workforce of the state police. Yes, I haven't been able to answer a lot of questions for our members based on the way these proposals are worded. The five-year exemption, the way it's worded refers to normal retirement eligibility. Yeah. And in the group C plan, according to the statutes, normal retirement eligibility is age 55. But the reality of the Group C retirement is that people retire at age 50. Right. And all of them intend to be out the door at age 50. And that five years from the way this is proposed, I don't think applies to them. 
So the way this is worded, I don't think anybody or, or very few people in the Group C retirement will have that five-year exemption. I think it would apply to almost everybody. Well, I don't, I don't know that you hit on what I was asking, and English isn't my primary language, so I probably wasn't asking it the right way. But if I'm a, if I'm a trooper and I got 10 years in with the state police, I'm, 20, I'm you know, say 28 years old, I'm going to want to get into the Massachusetts State Police if their investment period is five years and then I can still get my 20. I'm backing way off from that age 50 so that I'm going to make a decision before I'm 30 to get out. Yes, I think what we will see is a large number of our people make that decision very soon if these proposals were passed. So we're talking about the core of the workforce. How soon can they get into a pension system in another agency for that exact reason? Yes. Thank you. All right. Um, thank you, Mike. Please stick around in case someone has a question for you in a few moments. Um, I would like to invite uh, Patricia Gable. Welcome, thank you for your patience. Um, and we welcome you to share your thoughts with us. Thank you. I'm, I'm a little concerned if you're going to um, end at three that we may not get through the information I wanna share. Is that your current plan at this time, Madam Chair? Um, that is our plan. How much time do you think you need? Cause I can certainly um, uh, do some rearranging. So, well, perhaps we could start um, and the, um, if we can't finish, I hope that we would be able to uh, continue. Uh, Absolutely. To the Absolutely. Of next week. We are uh, the other, <laughs> yeah. Right. The other thing I wanted to mention is I'm in the middle of a storm here and the lights have flickered. So I might disappear. If I do, I'll, <laughs> I'll try and call in. And what I, what I will do is I think I'll turn off my video for a minute just to make sure it, it can be as stable as possible. But before I do that, I did want to acknowledge everyone on your committee. I've been following the work of your committee now for you know at least uh, a week and a half. Um, and uh, it isn't just the quantity of work you're dealing with, but the intensity of uh, your workload and what you've got to get through. And so, um, you know, we, we know from research uh, on judges, international research on judges that um, over time, the more things you have to decide uh, in a short period of time, the more difficult it is to make good decisions. And so when you're at the end of the day, at the end of the week, um, I just hope you listen with an open heart. <laughs> so I'm gonna uh, turn off my video and I'll start. So um, I really have four parts of my um, presentation to the committee today. I wanna to talk a little bit about the consultation process that led up to the treasurer's report uh, and also um, that has preceded the work in the legislature. Um, uh, there's been a lot of work done over the last few years um, and particularly a lot of work done to um, validate uh, the extent of the unfun unfunded liability issues. And, um, uh, and we don't challenge the uh, scope of the problem that you face. Uh, we agree that um, something needs to be done about the unfunded liability. Um, but we're also concerned about the, um, the fact that the judiciary has really been completely excluded from all the work that's been done up until this point and it isn't just a, an object, objection, oh, why didn't you talk to us? It really is a, um, uh, has profound impacts on the proposals that have been put forward because we haven't had an opportunity to uh, get the data that would be required to evaluate them, to run scenarios in a problem solving way um, with uh, other parties who are knowledgeable. And, um, and so that's a, a, something I'll talk about first. The second is I want to address the impact of proposals on the group F, the group F members in the judiciary. And although um, 
Some of our employees are represented by the union. We also have many people who work in the judiciary who are not represented. And uh, therefore, um, it, it's important that um, you hear about them as well. The third, and this is a very important uh, part of the proposal, is the impact of proposals that appeared uh, this week regarding the Group D members of the judiciary. Um, this was, this could have serious impacts. And the question is, are they intended impacts or unintended impacts? And then finally, um, I wanna talk to you about the actions that I'm gonna take um, on behalf of the judiciary uh, as a result of the other issues that, um, that we'll be uh, discussing. So the, um, with respect to the process, I did review the treasurer's report and I also reviewed some other resources. And um, the treasurer's office met with the Vermont State Employees Association, the Vermont Troopers Association, the Vermont National Education Association, and um, she and her office worked together with them to review possible scenarios and combinations of scenarios. She also met um, with um, the unions either weekly or twice weekly with the VSEA Board of Trustees and the legislative um, committee members, as well as over a hundred members of the VSEA council. The treasurer's office also um, met with the uh, Troopers Association uh, and the Board of Directors. And um, she's met with over 300 VSEA members and 700 NEA members and conducted 13 educational meetings with members. Um, the union boards got a chance to review draft PowerPoints, including recommended scenarios. And then the treasurer's office met again with each trustee board. Uh, I'm assuming also that um, in advance of the treasurer's proposal, uh, she undoubtedly met with high level members in the executive branch as well. As I mentioned, these are not just comments uh, to whine <laughs> about process. They really are substantive because they show the, the depth of analysis and dialogue that's gone into the proposals regarding some of the plans and the um, complete absence of anything like that regarding the group D proposal in the judiciary. I, I, um, I mention it because we need that and we need to find a way to have that same opportunity. And I don't know how that's gonna happen within your timeline, uh, but we were, we're ready to engage uh, if you are. Uh, the second thing I would like to address is the impact of the proposals on the group, group F members in the judiciary. Um, we have um, probably about 40% of the people who work in the judiciary are not represented by the VSEA. And that includes judicial officers. And it also includes um, managers and supervisors in the judiciary. I've heard from them because again, they haven't had the same opportunity uh, as others have to be educated about why these things are happening, why these proposals are coming forth and what the different scenarios are and what it would mean. Um, what I've heard from them um, is that They, um, you know, they're amazing people, um, just as many people in the state government are, they're dedicated under very difficult circumstances. In the judiciary, we have inadequate resources for the caseloads that we carry. And that was true even before the pandemic. And in the judiciary, we've continued to hear cases throughout, um, balancing the public health issues along with the um, issues of access to justice. And as some of your members undoubtedly realize, the population of people who we serve in the judiciary are among the most vulnerable in the state. Uh, we deal with child protection matters, uh, children um, in need of services, 
the possibility that parents may lose their children. We deal with uh, people who suffer from addiction problems and end up in the uh, criminal justice system. We deal with people with mental health problems. We deal with families who are breaking up. Um, there are civil cases such as eviction and foreclosure. There are civil cases involving important small business owners and large business owners. And, and the um, quality of the people who we have in the judiciary to address these issues are impressive. And um, they're, in terms of the people who are not judges and people who are, who are in the group F plan first, uh, by what they did not expect, they have always um, known that they could make more money on a salary basis outside the judiciary. But because of the retirement benefits that are available to them, uh, they've been willing to make that trade-off. And they believe that, and, and I'm not, in this sense, I'm only talking about what I've heard from them. I'm not talking about any legal characteristics related to their relationship um, to their employment with the state. But they believe that the retirement benefits are part of their current, for the work that they've done and the work that they're doing now. Um, they think of it as a deferred component of their compensation. And they're taken aback uh, with the idea that after having already um, put that work in, uh, in reliance on that and making uh, choices and decisions that cannot be undone, that uh, that, that compensation may uh, be retroactively taken away. And so um, I don't want to um, spend too much time talking more about the Group F employees, not because it's not important and not because we have a risk of losing our most seasoned managers, but because what you've heard from others about um, other employees in the state are true about them as well. We uh, not only are in the pandemic, but we've just completed a rollout of a technology project. We've, um, we have not only the electronic case management system, but during the pandemic, we rolled out a video remote system uh, where these require uh, changes in the way people do their jobs, require training and the like. And our senior leaders and managers are crucial uh, to be available to provide that support. And we have the same risk that everyone else has, that um, those people are likely to um, retire. Um, some will retire um, because of fear, uh, and the fear will be that uh, they will lose their benefits, and others may retire um, from a lack of confidence that uh, some of the statements that have been made um, of reassurance will actually end up applying to them. So I will, um, I don't wanna belabor that point now, not because it isn't as true in the judiciary or because those people don't matter as much, but because it's, um, the issues have been already been echoed uh, by others. I'd like to turn uh, to the group D pension. And um, I, uh, did go through, and I read the treasurer's report very carefully. Uh, the treasurer's report uh, does not mention the Group D pension anywhere. Uh, there are no scenarios run on the Group D pension. Um, it's impossible to pick out of the report if uh, Group D members were even considered in there. Uh, there are 55 of them. It's a tiny portion of the workforce, and yet they stand for the rule of law in Vermont. They are the uh, trial judges and the uh, Supreme Court justices. Um, we've never been told that that pension plan, the Group D pension plan has been in place for 50 years. And it has worked very well uh, in Vermont in terms of not only uh, providing incentives for the most qualified 
lawyers to consider being judges in the state, uh, but it also supports judicial independence. Uh, judicial independence um, sounds uh, you know, like a, a slogan. And um, in, we know in other parts of the country, uh, judicial independence, which is a premise of democracy, and judicial independence essentially means that a judge feels free to decide a case based on the facts and the law and not on political pressure and not on the fear that the judge will be punished if uh, he or she decides the case that way. And so it has been a cornerstone of our democracy, uh, both at the time uh, the United States was created and also um, at the time our own state um, uh, was founded. And judicial independence requires that judges not only uh, devote their full time and attention uh, to the work at hand, but they cannot be employed doing other things. They cannot do anything appreciably to earn money in other ways. And uh, it, the pension plan is designed not only to attract judges who will be taking cuts in pay to enter government service in comparison to what they can earn as lawyers, but it's also there to provide them with a, a motivation to stay in the judiciary uh, to go through the, um, the career track. Uh, the first five years that a person is a judge, um, they are really in a training mode. And so it is only after about five years that a judge can feel that he or she is uh, ready to really fully serve. Uh, then there's a, we look forward to then a very productive period for judges where they uh, work in all dockets, no matter where they came from. It's very important that we have diversity in our uh, judiciary. And the diversity is not just a question of gender and race and ethnicity, but it's also a question of practice area, of experience, of wisdom. Um, the um, if we have time, I don't know if we will, I, I can go into much more detail about what it is that um, the judicial nominating board looks for to even consider an attorney uh, to be a judge. And um, not only do, does an attorney have to have been practicing for 10 years, but they also need to be um, at the height of their profession. And so the average age right now of a trial judge, of a superior judge um, coming on uh, to the judiciary, starting their tenure in the judiciary is in their 50s. And so um, starting in their 50s, that means that we wanna motivate them to stay in the judiciary for a period of time that um, allows them to contribute fully uh, we're fortunate in that many of our judges, probably most of them work past retirement age. Every year they work past retirement age right now, which is 62. It means that uh, we're paying them as an employee, a full-time judge in the judiciary, and they're not moving into the retirement plan. And so we encourage them uh, to you know, continue to work as long as they feel healthy and willing to do so. And so you can see that judges are just starting uh, in state employ and starting that track at a time when troopers are leaving. <laughs> and so just as group C in the proposals had special exceptions, uh, group D is a comp completely different animal. The, um, I learned this week, um, in the committee because we've had a heck of a time trying to get the data to demonstrate why after no proposals were floated or issues were raised about the group D judges, that suddenly a proposal is thrown into the mix and we can find no data that does that analysis or shows any savings from this. I did understand from the testimony this week that um, from joint fiscal and from comments from some of your committee members 
that in fact, changing the uh, 50 year old retirement plan for judges that has worked really well was not uh, put in the proposal uh, because it did provide savings. Uh, rather, we understand that there was a sense that somehow maybe judges should have some kind of skin in the game. And so um, if we have an opportunity, I can uh, demonstrate to you that the proposal that came forward was not only the most punitive to judges of any of the other proposals, but that it has profound consequences that I hope were unintended consequences. But, but if there were intended consequences, then, then we really need to have a discussion. So the, um, this issue of um, the speed with which you need to work is in complete contradiction to the needs that we would have uh, to demonstrate why um, including the Judge D proposal in your overall pension proposal is inconsistent with the period of time with which you need to work. Um, and so I'd like to pause maybe there before I go on because I have a lot of detail and statistics about that, but I, uh, I don't wanna get into it and stop halfway and perhaps your members might have questions um, about this before I go further. Committee, any questions? Uh, Bob Hooper. Thank you, Madam Chair. And th thank you, Pat. Um, I suppose I don't get smacked for asking a question that I know the answer to, but I'm not really sure if Pat knows the answer to it, and I really don't. Pat, your department pays 14.7% as a percentage of payroll for each judge, and the judge pays 5.65. That adds up to something. Do you know what the actual plan costs as a percentage of payroll? So we don't manage the retirement plan. And that's the reason why I spoke so. Um, yeah, but it's just kind of a yes or no. Do you know what the plan actually costs? So we would know what comes out of payroll, right, for yeah. judges. And the process that led up to your, this proposal does not include any data like that. And okay. so, so the, um, the process that you have been going through, and I don't mean you in the committee, but I mean the people in general involved in developing proposals and scenarios never contacted the judiciary. And um, we have information, which I'm sure if we had been contacted would have uh, resulted, if not in not going down that road, uh, not making the proposals that were on the table. Um, okay. Unlike in the, um, executive branch where there's a department of human resources and a department of finance and management and an entire treasurer's office. We have one manager of human resources, one budget manager, and we don't have the treasurer's office. We have one manager um, of finance. And so we do engage um, at uh, sophisticated levels on projects but they need to be, uh, we need to be engaged in them. They just can't be thrown at us like that. We don't have a Chris Rupi who can go, oh, I wonder what this is. Okay. Um, and, and that information hasn't been provided to us, but we're happy to engage and then we will. Thank you. I'm, thank you. Go ahead, Peter Anthony. Uh, thank you very much, <clears throat> Madam Chair. Uh, could you tell me what, What's the general consensus as to why um, members do not apply to be on the bench until age 50? I assume that's sort of self-selection because uh, there's, no, there's no minimum age, as I understand it, to qualify. Thank you. Sorry, the mute button. Uh, I do understand why, and I can give you um, more information about that. So uh, the process of choosing judges goes through a judicial nominating board. 
the judicial nominating board is a, it's independent and it's composed of uh, appointees uh, from the bar association, the legislature and the executive branch. The judiciary has no um, representation on the judicial nominating board. There is in statute the um, qualifications to be a judge. And so the minimum qualification is 10 years that you have to have practiced uh, 10 years and you have to have practiced five years, uh, most recently in Vermont. The, um, the Judicial Nominating Board is actually the one who ends up selecting the nominees that end up going to the governor for appointment. And they are looking for the lawyers who are at the height of their profession, the lawyers who are most recognized for excellence, the lawyers who um, show not just technical excellence, but a, um, a commitment to their community to the rule of law and to justice, the, um, uh, the ability to write, um, the fact that um, they've uh, been successful and received references uh, from people uh, that they would be uh, the kind of people who would be successful at judge as judges in the cases we've discussed. They are the ones uh, producing people starting in the judiciary in their 50s, because the lawyers at the height of their profession have been practicing 20 something years. And as I said, I do have statistics on our judges, which we put together just in the two days <laughs> since we saw there was a group proposal that shows the many years in law practice that they spend before they are appointed to the bench. And this is to the benefit of the court system and to Vermonters. We want the wisest and best judges to hear these cases. And um, unlike um, some of the characterizations I've heard, being a judge is not a second career. Uh, being a judge is the continuation of a lifelong career in the law. And so for those people who do eventually make the choice to become judges, they have, this is especially true for trial lawyers because you do need to have courtroom experience uh, as part of the many qualifications that are set forth in the statute to be a judge. And so you're, because you're drawing at this level of people in, and remember that's an average number. So it means you're gonna get some people who are younger and some people who are older. But in general, you're bringing in lawyers not only at the height of their career in terms of professional accomplishment, but the height of their career in terms of compensation. And most people who work in the judiciary, um, uh, as I mentioned earlier, um, take a cut in salary in exchange for the benefits. For lawyers at the height of their career becoming judges, many of them have to make the decision uh, to, when providing this service, to take a substantial cut in pay. And the judge pension that we've had for 50 years has been there as a motivator uh, because it provides a, a level of certainty and security that if they give up law practice, they will be able to continue to um, you know, take care of their families and provide for their retirement and not be looking having to look at, okay, what am I gonna do when I stop becoming a judge? Am I gonna go back into law practice? That we'd much rather have them retire and then serve as retired judges when we need them because it, it supports judicial independence. We, once people commit to a life um, as a judge, it's a, it's a bit of a lonely life. They're cut off from a lot of associations that they used to have because of the judicial conduct uh, rules. And the judicial conduct rules really restrict their ability to associate uh, with groups and even with uh, you know, their fellow lawyers and friends in ways that could be perceived as uh, creating bias. And so it, it's, um, it's uh, you know, in some ways, 
it would be an exaggeration, but it's similar to committing to, you know, going to the seminary, you, you make a commitment to a certain kind of life that is more restricted than it would be uh, before that. Um, judges um, are mission driven as are most people in the judiciary. And so I don't wanna leave the impression that, oh, the, a, a judge is looking for, how am I gonna get the best pension possible? Oh, it, I mean, a lawyer does, oh, the judiciary, let's go there. But what they are looking for is if they're gonna make a commitment to a life in public service, then um, what will that mean for them and their families? And is that really, you know, it's a long-term commitment. Um, what will it mean? And so the, as I said, for 50 years, the pension plan has worked very well and no one's identified any issue with it. Uh, judges have to serve for at least 12 years to even get any um, you know, real benefit from the special aspects of the, of the um, uh, Group D plan. And so um, some of the things that have been put on the table uh, regarding changes in the judge plan are um, so much, such bigger changes that are being proposed for the other plan that the incentives and the impacts, particularly on the women who have only recently become more populous in the judiciary, you may be aware that there was a period of time when there was a real concern expressed about the lack of gender diversity in candidates who were being appointed as judges. And so there was a period of time when notwithstanding the percentage of women who are lawyers practicing in Vermont during those periods and even well before, that very few women were being appointed proportionally. That resulted in a meeting, um, an informal meeting among leaders of the three branches of government to try and examine uh, why this was happening. What was happening in the judicial nominating process that was uh, producing a lack of diversity? Uh, and why was it that after years of women applying, they gave up applying? And was there a perception that women were not gonna be permitted uh, to serve? As a result of that, a lot of changes have taken place. And the current uh, Judicial Nominating Board has uh, made great strides in reaching out to get better diversity in uh, the bench. And the better diversity, of course, it is gender, but it's also diversity in terms of the kind of lawyers who are um, considered leaders and at the height of their profession who are promoted to the bench. In the state court system, the kind of work that judges do, as I described earlier, is very much dealing with um, the, um, the, the vulnerable in society. A tremendous amount of work regarding family law, regarding mental health, regarding addiction, regarding uh, families who are challenged, regarding people facing eviction and foreclosure. And yet uh, lawyers who were practicing in those areas were not coming through in the nominating process. Most recently, finally, they are. And we're starting to see an uptick in the number of lawyers uh, who apply who might not have thought that they would be recognized before. The irony in the statistics that I have show that the most negative impact of the proposal would be on the women judges who serve in the judiciary. And that the majority of the people impacted in extremely odd and unusual ways are women. That um, the, your age um, is more important in the proposal you made than how many years you have on the bench. And so people who are appointed at the same time with the same number of experience on the bench would have dramatically different outcomes in the pension plan. We have uh, judges now who served earlier uh, in state government. And so they had um, one of the er other plans, perhaps they were a group F beneficiary. They were required at the time they became a judge and joined the group D plan 
they were required to take their own contributions that they had made to the other plan to buy into the Group D plan. And they were given calculations that showed uh, what that would mean. In other words, what the return on that investment would mean. And those people are now being told, no, what we told you before that had you make this change in your career, uh, that's not gonna happen. It's gonna be something completely different. Um, as I said, my, my hope and expectation is that th those were completely unintended consequences of your proposal. And again, we've only had two days <laughs> even to try and figure out, well, who's impacted by this and what it would mean. Um, and I haven't even had an opportunity to talk about what will that mean for the future of our ability to continue to recruit the best lawyers to be judges. And so normally if we had had a process that was similar to the process that's been applied to these other groups, all of these things would have come out. Um, we would have learned, are there savings by making changes to group D that would still uh, make sense from a pension design point of view? Uh, are there savings that wouldn't have people leaving and instead of becoming retired judges and coming back, going back into law practice or taking other kinds of jobs because of the dramatic changes in the proposals. And, and that really gets me to my fourth point, which is um, the judiciary realizes that because this work wasn't done, that we need to do it. And so we will be um, uh, seeking and engaging to get a pension design expert of our own. And we will do the work if we need to, if, if you're you know, gonna go down this road, uh, but as, as your own committee members have talked about, that kind of work is not quick and it's not easy and it requires resources and time. And the, um, the judges who serve the state of Vermont deserve the same um, careful attention uh, to these very dramatic issues as everyone else who's um, the subject of some of these proposals. And so we look forward uh, to working collaboratively with the legislature, with the executive branch, with the, everyone who has a stake in what kind of judiciary we have. Can we maintain an independent judiciary? What Think of the court cases that have been decided in Vermont over the last couple of decades. Cases out of Vermont have changed the law around the country. And that's because Vermont has been able to attract fine lawyers who became fine judges. And because of judicial independence, were able to make courageous decisions based on the facts and on the law. And they never had to look behind them to wonder, can I continue to make these kind of decisions because I've risked political um, disfavor or um, an important constituency in the state didn't like the way it came out. So as I said, I have much more detail and statistics that we can talk about with the judge pension, but I am uh, appreciate, as I said the other day, that you're the first player in this game that in asked us a question, invited us, uh, to participate, and we're eager uh, to work with you to um, help achieve a good outcome, and in particular, uh, recognizing the terrible financial situation that's facing the state. Thank you so much, Pat. Um, questions from committee members? All right, well, thank you so much. And for scheduling purposes, would you like us to schedule you in on Tuesday to continue with, uh, with what you prepared for today that you weren't able to get to? Or would you like to check back with us um, later in the week with, you know, after we've had a few more conversations? I, I don't wanna cut you short, but we, I did promise committee members they could stretch their legs a bit before our public hearing at four o'clock. Well, I, I would appreciate the opportunity to be scheduled. 
Mm -hmm. And um, hopefully it wouldn't take up much of your committee time, but then it would give you an opportunity to understand uh, some of the real potential outcomes of your proposed plan. Okay, we will uh, work to get you on the schedule for next week. And um, committee, thank you for, uh, for working into your three o'clock uh, break hour. And um, I trust committee that you all have the login information for the public hearing uh, for folks who are following along. Um, we, uh, the public hearing is in the Zoom webinar format. So we will be logging on as panelists and people who are coming to testify will come into the meeting as um, participants or attendees. Um, and they'll be able to see and hear what we're saying, but they won't be able to speak until we bring them up to the panel as if we were bringing them up to the, um, you know, the, the, the table in, in, you know, in our actual committee room. Um, the other thing that committee members should know is that um, IT would like us all to log on um, sometime between 3.30 and 3.45. But when you come on, please come on with your camera off and your and your um, self muted because there will already be attendees in the waiting room at that point, point. Um, and uh, so we won't be doing any any uh, chit chatting about uh, what everybody had for lunch today or whether they got <laughs> exercise or how much rain they've gotten so far this afternoon. Um, so uh, questions, Peter Anthony. It's not a question, Madam Chair. I, I look forward to the hearing tonight. I, I didn't want to in interrupt our guests to uh, follow my good friend, Bob Hooper, saying, you know, I want to take ownership of some of the suggestions that are out there. I, I authored some, and you very kindly and your vice chair incorporated some of those. And I don't want you to stand out there as if somehow or another this is something you all uh, uh, cooked up over the weekend without any uh, coaching. I, I coached you, so I want to take ownership of that. It's also clear to me, although I very clumsily uh, framed this uh, at the time when Jeff Bannon was there, I really think we have to separate uh, issues for which the investigatory time simply doesn't allow us to do what we need to do in the window that the speaker has talked about and try to address issues where we do think we understand enough to be able to plant the flag. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was trying to get at that with Jeff Bannon, not sure I succeeded. Um, and I'm sorry if I offended any of you that I was part of the conspirators on the um, amendment this morning from the member uh, from Burlington, but I, I, uh, I fell on that sword purposely. I'll take ownership of that. Um, I, I, if Steve were still listening, I'd say uh, I did that as a, as a matter of principle. I know perfectly well we can't pass a revenue aspect of a bill uh, and pass a veto. So, you know, that's kind of off the, off the radar screen. But I, I thought as a matter of principle, it was worth saying. Um, so I take ownership of that, too. And thank you very much for your indulgence. Committee, this is, uh, you know, this is a process where we all have to come to the table with our, um, our own thoughts, our own values, um, the responses that we get from our own constituents. And I recognize that we may not all um, come to the same conclusions in the end, but we will do so respectfully. And so thank you, Peter, for, for bringing that up. Um, and uh, we'll continue this work. Bob Hooper and then Mark and then I promised you guys a break. <laughs> well, nobody wants to go on break when they can listen to me, Madam Chair. Um, I, uh, you know, once again will reflect my endorsement of Peter's comments. Uh, it, as I said the very first day, this is very near to my heart and I do not control it well. That having been said, what time are we supposed to log on? Between three and three forty-five. <laughs> okay, I didn't hear you, Madam Chair, because the big mouth up in the corner was talking. Between three thirty and three forty-five, with camera off and muted. <clears throat> Thank you very much. You're welcome, Mark. <laughs>